Here to discuss the science of aging, please welcome Celine Haluwa, founder and CEO of Loyal, Cynthia Kenyon, Vice President of Aging Research at Calico Life Sciences, with Ross Anderson, staff writer at The Atlantic. Ah, okay. Um, Cynthia, Celine, I'm so glad that you guys are here. Uh, I'm really excited about this conversation as a person who is aging um, <laughs> and who has a dog also. Uh, is your dog Howard? aging? What's that? Is your dog aging? You know, undetectably, uh, <laughs> but yes. Uh, so, Cynthia, I want to start with you, and I was hoping that you could take us back. Now, I, I just want to flatter you uh, for the audience here so they have some idea of the tremendous contributions you've made to this field. Um, Cynthia was the first person to double the lifespan of a very tiny organism called a roundworm. Um, not that we want roundworms uh, living forever, but nonetheless, a huge step in this field. And what I want to talk about that in a little bit, but first, tell me what this field was like before that. Oh my god, yeah. So, it, it, well, understandably, as you age, you sort of fall apart in different ways. Hmm. Like, an old car, it's a lot of entropy, et cetera. So people generally thought that aging is just something that happens, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, there's nothing you can do about it, except maybe you could exercise and be a little healthier. But fundamentally, it's just a process of deterioration. And so there was a lot of resistance to it. There were people in the field working. This was in the early 19, 1990s, a long time ago now. Um, but you know, molecular biologists, I was at the University of California in San Francisco, and molecular biologists there, I mean, it was just a, a sort of a cesspool, really, of science. People thought, well, you work on aging. First of all, if you have delusions of grandeur, number one, and number two, you really weren't good at anything else, so you would go and do this. <laughs> Seriously, so it was really hard to get any graduate students to work on it, really, really hard, because yeah. people thought. They also thought, you know, if you look in nature, you can see that there are genes for aging, because dogs age faster than people. And if you look all around at different animals, they have very different rates of aging and lifespans. And that's because they have different genes. And the reason they have these different lifespans is because gene changes during evolution gave them different lifespans. So right off the bat, you have to do any experiments. You know that genes control aging. But even there, people will think, well, you know, there'll be all sorts of genes, many for the liver, some for the skin. And they'll all have tiny little effects. And so you never find them. Hmm. So it was just negative, negative, negative. And the work you did, it was a, just a single gene mutation. And I'd love for you to describe how you did that. But also, your, I, this was before email, but at, maybe your snail mail, your like, phone calls. Like, you must have had a lot of people reaching out to you, and maybe some weird people too. Well, let, I'll just talk about this story, because it's a mm. really cool story first. Um, so basically, so we, I happen to already be studying this little teeny weeny roundworm about the size of a comma in a sentence called C. elegans. And I was studying you know, how the fertilized egg creates a nice animal with all its cells and everything. But these little guys age and die in just a little over two weeks, and they really get old. So with, when you work on these animals, what you can do is you can just randomly change genes. I won't go into how you do it, but you can treat them with something called a mutagen, which just changes genes randomly. And then you can ask, OK, do I find genes that affect you know, muscle development or something like that? Or you could ask, can I find genes that, when you change them, make the animal live longer? Mm. And it's great, because if there aren't genes like that, like if all genes have teeny little effects, and there's one for the head and blah, 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 then you're not going to ever find anything. So you can just stop easily. You can just stop. But if there is something, then, then you have a gene. You have a gene change. And so molecular biology lets you follow it to the biochemistry, to the underlying truth of the system. So we did that. We looked for long-lived worms, essentially. And we were very lucky. And the reason I thought that, it, that all these evolutionary biologists were maybe wrong is because in the study, this is a little bit technical, but it's really cool. In the study of the fertilized egg turning into an animal, which is called pattern formation, it turns out that there are gene changes that you can make where one little gene change can cause a fruit fly to have, instead of two wings, four wings. Like just one change, a whole new wing. Or the antenna turns into a leg. So it turns out, <laughs> I know, it's, but it's true. It seems, but you know, once you, once you get that, once your mind gets that you can do that, which is hard to do, but once you get it, 
Then you think, ah, oh, all these lifespans in nature that are so different. Maybe they're, like I thought, well, maybe there's kind of a thermostat, sort of. You could turn it up or down. There would be, like, you know, a universal way of controlling the aging rate. And it's set to run fast in the little worm. And it's set to run slower in the dog and really slow in humans, for example. So oh. that's the idea I had based on these um, extra wing ideas. So, because I used to study that. So anyway, you just need a mission. You need sort of something that motivates you, and that motivated me. So we found them. We found mutants that are, that is an animal with a gene change that lived twice as long as normal. And it was amazing, because you look at these little worms on their little culture dishes. Um, they, they, eat, they look on like it's something like jello. They're eating that with bacteria on it, which they eat. Anyway, so you'll see the normal worms, after about two weeks, they're either dead or they're almost dead. They look horrible. Um, and then you, at the same time, you see the, the worms, the long-lived worms, they look young. So I have a nice story about this. Like, what if you are, you know, you're like in your 40s and you're dating. Let's say you're a guy and you're dating. And you find a, <laughs> you go out with a woman, let's say, and you're having dinner with her and you like her and you ask her how old she is. And she says, and she thinks she's your age. And she says, I'm 80. And I, I know. That's what it's like. So you look at these worms, and they, seriously, seriously, I'm really Ross, serious. you look triggered. And they look, <laughs> they look younger. It's not like those pictures that you see of people that look 90 that are great. They're running a marathon, or they're jumping high, but they still look 90. This is different. This would be a 90-year-old that you think is 45. So it's really like your hair stand up. Mine are starting to stand up right now. But anyway. That's what we found. And so let me just be sure here I haven't forgotten anything. Yes, yeah, so the basic point, that the thing that was really new was that the whole idea that aging just happened and there's nothing you can do about it went out the window. Because what that said is that aging is controlled by the genes. There are genes that actually really control the rate of aging. And that it's plastic. The worms are, have a normal lifespan, but they don't have to have that lifespan. They could have a twice as long lifespan and age twice as slowly. And so it changed everything, actually. And I can tell you about why they live longer if you ask me the question, or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very helpful, actually. Um, uh, Celine, I want to ask you, uh, so you have this company, Loyal, um, that you founded that uh, really is trying to do life extension for dogs. And um, I was wondering, I, as I said earlier, I have a dog, and I hope that he lives a very long time. Wish he would live forever. Uh, Tell me why dogs for you. Were you like a dog lover, or was this like a McKinsey thing where it's like, oh, we've God. identified a huge market? Or I'm so <laughs> offended right now. <laughs> I, I would like to clarify that I did not uh, get into McKinsey. I like failed all the like little yeah. like practice, like how many windows are there in New York City thing. And you yeah. can still be a successful founder. Um, <laughs> so I, I started with dogs Actually, incidentally, and actually my story is very tied um, to Cynthia's work. So Cynthia, one of her mentors was this woman named Laura Deming, and Laura Deming was my mentor when mm. I decided, you know, screw university, I'm going to drop out and move to Silicon Valley and like go do SF stuff. And she had learned about the biology of what Cynthia was working on, and specifically, um, you know, I won't steal your, obviously, your thunder on, you know, the, the biology of what you're working on, but the high level, the, basically this genetic pathway in worms that more than doubled their lifespan. And since that study had been done, I think it was the late 80s, early 90s, that had been replicated and expanded all the way from worms to mice to rats. There was really interesting correlation data, actually in Ashkenazi Jew centenarians, having that same or similar genetic uh, change that Cynthia did in the worms, showing lifespan extension, obviously correlation in human studies. And so Laura, uh, when I was like 22 or 23, charged me with saying, this biology is so fascinating, and it's been so well validated that if you modulate this pathway in everything from a tiny worm to theoretically a human, that you could extend lifespan significantly. But everybody thinks you can't get a drug FDA approved for a lifespan extension, right? Mm -hmm. So figure out how can we take Cynthia's work and turn it into an FDA approved drug for lifespan extension? Um, and of course, we started in humans. So that's what I, I was, you know, a human bio person. Laura's a human bio person. Um, but while I was doing that and I was perusing the literature, I found these really interesting pages, papers looking at the biology of dog lifespan and dog size. Mm. 
Um, so the bigger a dog is, the shorter their average lifespan is. And at the extremes, it's actually a two-axis differential. So if you have a Great Dane, the, you know, they might have a lifespan of seven to eight years. While if you have a Chihuahua, <laughs> they might have a lifespan of 17 to 19 years, right? They live much, much longer. And as far as I'm aware, there's no other species where you see that 2x differential. Like, don't let the shoes fool you. I'm actually pretty short. I'm not going to live <laughs> twice as long as some of the taller people here, right? And long story short, it looks like it boiled down to when we selectively bred dogs to be really big or really small, we selected inadvertently for these genes that Cynthia had discovered, I think, 30 years ago at that point. And it seems like we gave these big dogs an accelerated aging disorder. So a Great Dane is literally aging at a 2x faster rate than a Chihuahua. Um, so I thought this was really cool. I've always been a dog person. I grew up with like 15 cats, four dogs, like rescued squirrels, it was, it was a whole thing. Um, and, but I didn't think it was a company. <laughs> I never thought I'd start a company. And long story short, I just, I don't know, it was such an earworm. And like I remember when I first started thinking about Loyal, and telling people about it in like 2018, 2019, people would literally laugh in my face when I said the phrase dog longevity. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I just couldn't let go of it. And it just, people started hearing about it because I would just like talk about it because I didn't have anything else to talk about. So I talked about what I was working on. Um, and long story short, realized that this was an opportunity not only scientifically, but also commercially, which if you're not independently wealthy, which I sure as hell am not, that's actually one of the best ways to develop you know, new things, right? Can you align commercial incentives with the scientific incentives? And I think that's something we've done really well at Loyal. And is it, just to connect the idea, is, is it the case that it'll be easier to get FDA approval potentially in a dog rather than for a human treatment? Yeah, so easier, but not the way that people think. So dogs are FDA regulated. Dog drugs are FDA regulated. The bar is actually extremely similar to human drugs, um, in part because People will take veterinary drugs. We all remember the COVID-19 horse dewormer fiasco, um, which we're both horse people, actually. And every time we go and buy dewormer for our horses now, there's like big warnings, like not for human consumption. <laughs> does not cure COVID, which it does not. Um, but it's, quote, unquote, easier because dogs live such a shorter life, mm. right? If I'm trying to do a lifespan study in us, it would take decades to see right. if a drug was having any, any benefit. And proving the counterfactual is extremely difficult. In a dog, you know, we're running, um, as far as we know, the largest um, animal health pivotal study that's ever been run. It's about 1,000 dogs across 60 veterinary sites across the U.S. And we don't know for sure because nobody's done it before, but we think the study will be about five years oh. to hopefully show uh, a reduction in mortality risk in dog street was our drug. Um, and that makes it, you know, feasible just from a commercial standpoint, right, like yeah. to fund that study. I imagine that... Um I don't want to speak for our audience, which may be more scientifically sophisticated than me, but I imagine the exact technical particulars of how this works in the biology of an animal are quite complicated. But could you tell me why, if this has been done in roundworms and it's been done in mice, which are mammals, um, why should it be that much more difficult uh, to do in a dog? Is a dog like a massively more complicated organism than a mouse? Um. So maybe we should talk a little bit about the biology. It's really sure. pretty simple. Oh, great. So in these little worms, we found out what the gene was that we cloned, I mean, sorry, that we changed. And um, it turns out the gene is what they call a hormone receptor. And you all know what hormones are. There's all sorts of them, adrenaline, testosterone, estrogen, many of them. But the way that the tissues know the hormone is there is they have these things that look like baseball gloves on their, that stick out that are called hormone receptors bind to the hormone. And that's what this gene called DAF2 was. It was a hormone receptor. And, the hor and so what happened, strangely enough, was that when we made the change, the gene change that made them live longer, we made the receptor not work as well. So we damaged it. It still worked, because if, it turns out if you don't have any, you die. Humans die, everybody dies. But if you have a little bit, you live long. And you can ask, well, why is that? So the hormones that are relevant here are hormones that you've all heard of. They're insulin and another hormone called insulin-like growth factor, or IGF-1. Everybody has them. And, and they allow your body to take up and process nutrients. And they also allow, they promote growth. But, and so and during the happy stage, when food is everywhere, things are working really well. But it turns out, of course, things in the environment can create stresses, like less food, or you know, other kinds of stresses, like high temperatures, or um, 
ultraviolet light, things like this, many different kinds of stresses. And it turns out that this is really cool, that having a receptor that doesn't work as well has informational quality. It, it sends, it sort of tells the animal that it might be in trouble. And the animal has a way of responding to that trouble. It turns out these animals could be way more resilient than they normally are. So they turn on all these genes. More than 100 genes in the DNA get switched on. And these genes allow the proteins to fold better. They get rid of damaged proteins better, easier. They prevent infections. They do all sorts of things. They even, there's even a, a, something called a, like a recycling station called autophagy in the, cell, in the cells. And it, it revs up autophagy. So you get rid of all the bad stuff and make more goods. Anyway, so all that gets turned on. So basically, these little worms, and not just worms, flies, mice, probably humans, they have in them the ability to be more resilient than they need to be. Mm. But why be more resilient all the time if you don't need to be? So probably it's just activated by changes in the environment where it's, you, you want to not die until times get better. Like if there's not a lot of food, you don't want to starve to death. So you maybe become more resilient, have fewer progeny, and these are what the animals do. And then when food comes back, it's fine. So that's the hormone system, and it's conserved. The animals are resistant to everything you can imagine. It's true of the worms, the flies, the mice, maybe the dogs. She was telling me that her dogs seem sort of fragile, and that this might the old dogs as they age. But anyway, so that's the biology. It's a very universal biology, and I think it can explain. I mean, I think they live longer because they're more resilient, because the, cha the damage of aging, if you will, can be rectified, prevented, and, and rectified. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So potentially, then, there's no difference between a mouse and a dog and how they would respond to this kind of treatment. Yeah. In fact, we found another gene, gene number two, that was totally required for, um, for the long-lived long animals to live long. It's a gene called FOXO. And it's a, it's a gene regulator. So it goes into the, sits on the DNA, which are genes, and switches them on and off. And if you don't have that, that guy, then whether you have this baseball glove change or not, it doesn't matter. They don't live long. And it was just shown by someone that um, that same gene is needed in mice that have this long-lived mutation mm -hmm. in order for them to live long. So it's a kind of resilience gene. So it probably really is the same biology. Mm -hmm. And it might work in humans. So with humans, though, to do a trial, the way, the way it works right now, it might work differently someday. Maybe there'll be a frailty scale or something like that, so you could actually measure aging as it's taking place. People are trying to figure out how to do that. But meanwhile, a lot of this, this biology, or the biology that controls aging, there are certain diseases where that biology can be like way out of whack, like way too strong. So you'll get cancer, for example, would be an example. You know, in fact, all of these gene changes make all these animals less sensitive to cancer. You know, for ex that's just an example, but it could be other things. So you could imagine that you have a you know, piece of biology and you have a drug that you think is going to turn it down and it would be perfect to extend lifespan, let's say, in a mouse, maybe a person. But you, what you do is you give it to a person that has a disease where it's way too high. So you just want to turn it down somewhat. And kind of like Celine's dogs, you could almost argue well, I don't know. It's the, the difference between aging and a disease is a cement, whatever it is. But anyway, these dogs have like way too much of this stuff. So she's kind of bringing it back to normal. It's kind of like as if they have a disease, even though they're nice, happy dogs. They just age faster. Yeah. Does that make sense? I hope that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to be quiet. It's not a big smile. You know, that. Um, <laughs> if, uh, That's a good strategy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> also for dating. Um, uh, I'm married, so none of these dating jokes apply. <laughs> Let me ask you, and, and Celine, we'll use the example of dogs. Um, you know, uh, when people think about life extension, the life extension that maybe we don't want is like, you get another 10 years or 20 years of being 90 years old, right? Yeah. And with all the kind of, or some of the limitations that that comes with. Um, in the fullness of time, you know, if like the greatest vision for Loyal were to come true, would it be the dogs, would they have their prime extended? Yeah, that's exactly how we think about it. We're trying to extend the healthy middle years of your dog. So the years where maybe, you know, you're not going to have that like crazy puppy exuberance, which probably is a good thing, yeah. honestly, for your yeah. shoes. <laughs> um, but your dog, you know, wants to go and play, like play fetch and go to the park and run on the beach, right? And has like the stamina um, and ability to do that. 
Um, that's something that we look at in our trials too. So our pr the predominant thing we look at is lifespan extension, in part actually for, in, for a reason that Cynthia said, which is just you can quantify it very objectively. You know, the dog is alive, the dog is dead, right? And it, it's a bit grim, but it, it, it's extremely objective. And it's kind of a proxy for quality of life, especially in dogs where you have voluntary euthanasia when a dog's quality of life hits a certain uh, low level. Um, but then actually the other thing we're looking at is exactly this, it's explicitly quality of life. Um, one thing is the frailty index, to, to your point, and the other thing is a, a dog owner reported measure of basically quantifying like how active does your dog seem, how happy does your dog seem, do your dog seem to recognize you, like things like that. And it's not perfect, it's not a great tool, um, but it's the pe best tool we have and we've shown that it does correlate with a dog's um, disease burden and it does correlate with some of the things that we're looking at mechanistically. Um, so yeah, I think it's extremely important. I think honestly dog owners would buy something that just extended the quality of life, even if it didn't change the maximal lifespan at all. Yeah, I, I really, there's something so lovely about this. Oh, sorry. Can I speak to that too? Of course. Because in, you, you all know about this demographic inversion that we have. You know, we have the yeah. ratio of elderly people to younger people is going up, up, up. And so that creates lots of problems, as you know. And one thing that would be great from a societal perspective is if these older people are healthier, if they're more functional. Yeah. And from a personal perspective of, of each person, obviously also to have a better, what we call a health span, is a real mm -hmm. goal. And these, these changes that we're talking about that make people more resilient, they also make them disease resistant. Yeah. So I think that's a real, it's a, it's a real, real goal that we have. Yeah, and actually now I'm old. I wasn't. When I started, I was in my 30s. <laughs> but you know, I've been giving these talks, but I'm now old and I'm experiencing it. And this is Cynthia saying this. It could be not every, I could be the only one that thinks this. But I am perfectly, I know, I, 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 maybe I'm wrong, but of course I know I'm going to die one day. One day that will be the last day. But when you're older, at least when I'm older, like I am now, I'm not thinking about dying. That will happen one day. But every day, you know, you think, well, if I pick this heavy thing up, am I going to hurt my wrist? Mm -hmm. You know, or you, cannot, you know, I get out of bed, it can't, a little creaky. You notice that stuff, and you don't like it. That's, I don't know about you guys, but that's what I think about, is just being able to do stuff I used to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I well, so there's something so lovely about the idea of, like, our dogs going out ahead of us on this kind of cultural experiment yeah. of living longer. <laughs> And, I, you know, the, the science of this is, is sort of endlessly fascinating, but some of the cultural dimensions of it, I think, are really fascinating, mm -hmm. too. And I want to talk about those maybe in humans in a bit, but first let's talk about them with dogs, like, again, engage, uh, imagining, like, wild successes for Loyal, all your SF dreams coming true. Um, it, and Texas dreams. And Texas dreams, awesome excuse call. me. Um, <laughs> imagine that it were possible to double the, life, uh, the lifespan of a dog, for instance. Um, uh, as we have in the roundworm, uh, how would that change the shape of our relationships with these animals? Because which are deep and profound, but are, are usually circumscribed by kind of only occupying one particular stage of our lives. Yeah. Well, so there's a couple of things to this, and this was actually the other portion of kind of the ideas that became loyal that convinced me to start it, which was you know the there's always kind of been this negative narrative around working on aging and working on lifespan extension, working on longevity, right? If you think about it, it's been that way for centuries, right? It's like, you know, these like snake oil things that if you buy this, you'll live longer. If you rub this on you, you'll live longer. And it's, it's just all like BS money grabs, right? And now kind of the theme is like, oh, billionaires trying to live forever, right? Like they have everything but longevity and now they're trying to buy that. And one of the things I really love about dogs is that it's such a wholesome, like very like consensus, idea to help dogs live a longer, healthy life. Like even if you're a cat person, you believe <laughs> <laughs> that the little angels on earth that we have dogs, like deserve to have a longer, healthier life. And it's just, it, it, it's not as fraught with all this socioeconomic and other you know, health insurance system issues that we have in the US, right? And that was something that we worked on, you know, I, I, I think we're gonna be able to deliver on is, a drug that is priced that, you know, in a way that the majority of Americans will be able to afford it from day one, and that was super important to me. Um, so that was one. 
Um, and I'm hoping that that will help introduce this idea of longevity or aging, which I think is just a really sexy way of saying preventative medicine from multiple age-related diseases at the same time. Mm. That's a mouthful. Dog longevity sounds much cooler, so I say dog longevity. Um, so I'm hoping that it will like, normalize it to the point where, you know, there's a couple of different ways to affect change. I know there's like, a lot of political panels and whatnot going on. One is like, you know, you can tackle it directly with like lobbying or cash or whatever, right? Uh, the other is just kind of normalizing things in a cultural level. And I think if you can normalize the fact that I can go to the vet and ask, my, ask them for a longevity drug for my dog, why can't I do that for my grandma? Mm -hmm. I think that's actually one of the biggest levers for you know, enacting the sort of changes that will be necessary to make this start you know, happening in humans. Um, and then the other side of it was this idea of kind of building a pharma brand that people love. Because I think actually, obviously, there's a lot of issues with pharmaceuticals and drug availability and access and affordability in the US, don't get me wrong, but developing medicines is an extremely important piece of work. Mm -hmm. And it's shocking how low NPS a pharma company is. And I think there's an opportunity if you're building a drug to keep your healthy dog, relatively healthy dog, healthy longer, and you're not being like, you know, going broke or going into bankruptcy to afford it. And it's a positive thing, right? And it's all about celebrating the love that you have with this animal. Um, Again, I'm hoping that will bleed into an interest in the other things that are going on. Hmm. Let's talk about those other things that are going on. Um, <laughs> Cynthia, you come to us from Calico, an alphabet company. And, uh, you know, uh, Celine was telling us that basically, you know, it's very difficult to do human trials because we live so long and maybe there's more red tape around it. Um, I, has that been really limiting for the ecosystem, or you know, are we going to have our dog moment soon? Well, um, yeah, a lot to say about this. Lots yeah. and lots and lots. So um, I also want to make the point before I even start that all the work I told you about with these little worms was done at the University <coughs> of California, which is a you know, university. Yeah. And it was funded by NIH, is basic research, because I was curious. And not just me, but all these people out there, they're just curious. Can you do this? So I think this has created a whole industry that's real. It's not like the snake, there is snake oil there, but there's a real, real biology there. So I just wanted to like give a you know, shout out to the NIH for that. So that's the first thing. But then um, the next thing is, so I, we, told about, we talked about this insulin IGF-1 pathway for aging, but there's a lot of other ones. Turns out people, of course, have been working on this now molecularly for quite a long time. And there's all sorts of things that can make mice Live, either live longer or at least live a lot healthier. So for example, you can take a young and an old mouse, you can stitch them together so they have one circulatory system. I know it sounds bizarre, but you can, anyway. Or you can just inject <laughs> old blood into, anyway. But the young mouse gets this older. This is the Peter Thiel blood the, boy thing. Yeah. The, right young mouse, <laughs> the young mouse gets older and the old mouse gets younger. So you can try to find out What's in that? What is the factor that did that? Then there are certain cells called senescent cells that become more abundant with age that are like little inflammation factories. They're just spitting out inflammation. If you clear those out, you get a much better health span, happier old age. So these, I'm just saying that there's more than one thing. There even seem to be ways to roll back the clock, actually, which I won't talk about unless you ask me. But anyway. Uh, I'm asking. <laughs> but, well, really? Go right ahead. OK, yeah. OK, OK. This is, this is unless you guys don't want to hear about that. <laughs> I know. It's really cool. It's really cool. So you know about Dolly the sheep. You know yeah. that you can mm -hmm. take a skin cell or a cell from an adult animal or the nucleus from it where the DNA is, and you can, um, you can subject it to what are called Yamanaka factors, which are gene regulators. And it's, they're named after the person who got the Nobel Prize for, for doing this. You can turn that old cell into an embryo cell. So you can f you know, basically fertilize it and have a whole new animal. So you can take an old skin cell and you can manipulate it with these Yamanaka factors, which are gene-changing factors. They turn other genes on and off. You can get back, 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 all the way to the beginning. And then that, it was a skin cell, but now that one cell, when it's you know, basically fertilized, essentially, can make a whole animal, can make all the tissues. Mm -hmm. So that's amazing, right? It's like an extra pair of wings, maybe more amazing. But that was a Nobel Prize. People got their head around that. And it's, it's called cloning, you know? But you know that. So 
what's new and cool is it turns out that if you take those little Yamanaka factors and instead of keeping them going all the way back to the beginning, you just do it a little ways in an animal, you can make the animal younger and you can make it live longer. I know, it sounds crazy, but you can do this. You can, people have shown that they can extend the lifespan of mice that are kind of engineered to age too quickly and they can make all the different tissues apparently younger. So it's tricky, we can't do it in people because for example, one of these so-called factors also causes cancer, so it's called mix, so there's problems. But the, the concept is out there. The idea is that if we could kind of get control over these, these factors and make them obey us and do what we want them to, or maybe take some cells out, like old immune cells and just kind of make them younger and put them back in. You know, maybe, maybe we could roll the clock back. So there are lots of people all over the place trying to see if that can happen. It's a long, sh it's not as, this part, the IGF-1 sort of stuff, mm -hmm. it just works. At least the mice, you just make the gene changes, they just all by themselves live longer. Mm -hmm. But this is different. This is, this, we have to figure out how to do it safely. But, you know, that's the way great things start, yeah. these kinds of observations. Anyway, so there are millions of companies now, not millions. Mm -hmm. There used to be at least 100. Now there's a downturn, so there are fewer than 100. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oil exists. But, there's still a lot of them, and there will be more again. You, mm. you know, there's an ebb and flow of these things. <laughs> but they all, they, what they have in common is that they're, they're, they're all science-based, science and they're, they're taking pieces of this biology that I just told you about and trying to make drugs out of it. Mm. And they're getting them approved first for diseases, probably, because there's a regulatory path for that, but then maybe for aging also, mm. you know, eventually. So can I say one more thing? Yeah. Oh, this is something, this is like, everybody has a hobby horse. Here's my hobby horse. So, this is like a, a meeting full of famous people, some of who have a lot of money. And when I go to these meetings, I kind of feel like the camp nurse sometimes because all these people that I think are amazing will come up and talk to me. I think, oh, I really want to know how you make trucks, you know? And they'll say, well, Cynthia. I said, what? And they'll say, I'm taking metformin, <laughs> rapamycin, this NAD precursor, and uh, taurine. Is that the right combination? <laughs> do, what do you take? Should I be taking that? And I mean, everyone asks me that question, and they should ask me. That's why I'm invited to these things. But the fact is, I don't know what they should take. Number one, I don't know. And number two, this is really heartbreaking. I will never know. And the reason is that all those things I just mentioned are easy to get. So you can't have a phase three trial in humans that has, you know, it's cost of 500 million to a billion dollars to do this right. This is like, even if we really knew how to measure aging, but if you, if you measure mortality or something that you can measure, mm. you know, you can, these things don't cost very much. So you can't afford a trial. Forget profit. I'm just talking about getting your money back. Because like, let's suppose aspirin, aspirin actually turns out to extend mouse lifespan a little bit. So let's just use that as an example. Let's suppose you find out that aspirin, this is probably, who knows, I'm not saying it's true, but let's suppose it affected, it could extend your life, make you more resilient and all that. What are you gonna do? compete with Bayer? I mean, what are, how are you going to do this? So there's not a business model. There's not a business model. But some of those things might work. They might really work. And we'll never know. So I, as a side project, having nothing to do with Calico, would like to start a kind of what I call the World Health Span Organization. So it's like the World Health Organization, except for Health Span. So it would be funded by governments, maybe nonprofits, and it would be a place would, that would fund high quality, large studies of all these things that extend lifespan in animals and seem good and are cheap and easy to get so that people would know. Because if they work in people, I mean, everyone could take them. They're not expensive. Yeah. Third world people, everybody would be more resilient, have it you know, easier to support as an old person. It would be fabulous. But we can't do it because there's no business model. Mm. So just thought I'd, I wanted to say that. No, no, I, uh, uh, I'm in favor. I heard a clap. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, I want to give our audience uh, a chance to ask some questions. I think we have a mic stand set up somewhere uh, over here. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it requires traveling to the mic stand. Um, we've got a, a volunteer. And we've got time for a few. Here's our first one. I'd like to know, are you thinking of trying any of these things on yourselves uh, to expand your lifespans? 
Um, but um, I read about in our newspaper in Sarasota County, Florida, that there was a uh, veterinarian that mm -hmm. used your dog and, they, and it brought these dogs back to a healthy life and it was wonderful. And I'm thinking, well, how can I get this for my son's dog who's old? And, and how long before we actually can't, he'll probably die before you know, he can get it. But how long before we can actually be able to have access to this um, helpful thing for our dogs? Yeah, so we have um, these study sites across the US. We actually have yeah, one in Saratoga and um, quite a few in Florida in general. Uh, lots of dog lovers in Florida. Um, there's a couple of options. So you can enroll in the study if your dog qualifies, but the one thing you really should be aware of is there's a 50-50 chance of getting the actual drug or placebo, right? Because we have to prove the counterfactual of does a drug extend lifespan relative to a placebo. Um, so that's something I try to be like really candidly, like if this, like something that keeps me up at night is this study not working, not because the drug doesn't work, but because people are too worried that they have the placebo and elect to just go buy the drug when it's available. And so we've really selected for people who A, are excited and motivated by the, you know, we cover all the vet care and the dog gets chronic care for the rest of their lives, um, but also who kind of want to be a part of history in some ways by participating in this study. And I think that's probably some of the, the stories you've read are from dog owners who feel that way. Um, but we're running, and none of these things are guaranteed, nothing is guaranteed, asterisk, asterisk. I know I'm in DC, I promise I won't cross the line, but we're running towards hopefully conditional market approval next year. So that would mean that you could go to your veterinarian and if they think it's appropriate uh, for your dog, prescribe it. So, hmm. fingers crossed. All right, just a quick question. I'm, uh, Celine, this is for you. Um, I'm reading the statement that from the data that you collected, the FDA believes that the drug is likely to be effective. Mm -hmm. They rarely make this kind of statements. They usually say it's either effective or not effective. What does it mean, likely to be effective? Yeah, so this is a really interesting. So one of the other kind of why nows for Loyal was this creation of this new regulatory path in the veterinary FDA called expanded conditional approval, which basically means that you have to hit the full normal safety bar the full normal manufacturing bar, but only show reasonable expectation of efficacy. Um, and then run your full study that proves definitive efficacy or substantial evidence of efficacy is the technical term, um, which is this lifespan extension study. And they created this regulatory pathway in 2019 to basically make it commercially feasible to develop drugs that have really complicated and long pivotal studies, of which a lifespan drug is probably the longest uh, pivotal study that you're going to get in dogs. And so what you're referencing is um, probably the most important milestone Loyal has had, which was us earning that, uh, basically completing that effectiveness package through those pathways, so that reasonable expectation of effectiveness. FDA agreed that our drug that's based off of Cynthia's work is reason, reasonably to be expected to extend the lifespan of dogs, AKA we've hit the efficacy bar necessary. Um, that's a huge deal, most drugs fail, you know, it, it, and again, we haven't shown definitive lifespan extension, but we've shown quite a bit. Um, and, but it was also the first time, as far as I'm aware, that the agency has publicly acknowledged, acknowledged that a drug can be approved for lifespan and healthspan extension. There is no disease, right? We're not developing drugs for any disease state. The inclusion criteria, there's obviously some niche exclusions, but generally speaking, it's by weight and age of your dog, and that's it. Um, and that was one of the reasons why we started was the biology that Cynthia developed, because it's so broad, it's so broadly applicable, and that was something that was really important for, we wanted to prove that, right, and prove that a drug could be approved for lifespan and healthspan extension on its own. Um, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully more of those coming in the next couple of years. Mm. Celine, Cynthia, thanks for being here today. This is really Thank great. Thank you. Thanks for having us. <laughs>